Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name's Rob Jell. I'm the president of the Royal Society of Victoria, and I welcome you to this to this meeting, uh, where we have a terrific lecture planned for you. Um, Welcome to people uh, in person here in the Ellery Theatre at the Society, but also to people online uh, on Zoom and live streamed on YouTube as well. Welcome to everybody. As we begin in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that all of us in Australia are located on the traditional lands of this continent's first scientists, the many different First Nations peoples who belong to our diverse lands and waters of this remarkable region of our uh, amazing planet. Um, for those of you uh, with us in Melbourne, we are coming to you from Melbourne in the Port Phillip region, a region called Nam, by the peoples of the Kulin Nation, who have lived in this country for tens of thousands of years. Uh, we're specifically located on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Wurrung language group, never ceded uh, the land, and I invite everyone joining us tonight, particularly online, uh, either through uh, Zoom or the YouTube live stream, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the local country that you're on. And join me in paying respect to Elders past and present, and likewise uh, extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who have joined us in the meeting tonight. We're delighted to have with us tonight uh, Professor Raymond Cass, an Emeritus Professor in Volcanology with Monash University School of, At of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment. Uh, Ray will no doubt help us to understand some of the complex interac interactions of the Earth's various systems in contributing to changes in a planet's climate over billions of years and more importantly test how these processes compare to the contributions made by we humans in just the past couple of centuries. In fact, it's probably only the last few decades in particular. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Ray before we start. Uh, Ray is well known in international volcanology in the research, research community for his research on uh, volcanic eruption processes and volcanic hazards on modern volcanoes around the world. Ray was president of the International Association for Volcanology from 2011 to 2015. Uh, Ray's undertaken research in collaboration particularly with the mining industry to develop a better understanding of mineral ore deposits such as gold, silver, copper, lead, zinc, nickel and diamonds hosted in ancient volcanic rock successions. He supervised over 50 postgraduate students, he's the author or co-author of over 150 research papers, he's written one book on volcanology and I believe there's another one in production uh, and he's still undertaking research although nowadays a little bit more at a slightly more relaxed pace as Emeritus Professor. Well, welcome, Ray, come up. Um, Thank you, Rob. I should, I should let everybody know that tonight's lecture was his idea. Uh, and Mike came to me and said, uh, gee, this is going to, what about this? This is going to be really good. So we have been delighted to uh, take up your suggestion, Ray. And uh, I guess I should be inviting all members, if you do have a suggestion of something you'd like to speak about, we're really trying to use this building much more frequently. So we're delighted to have you here. Um, we were just chatting earlier uh, that Ray's approach to climate change is going to be slightly different than some of the ones that we see, but nevertheless, we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. Yes, so, so about six weeks ago, I zoomed in on a presentation by Andrew McIntosh from my uh, department, he's the, the head, of, head of school, on um, uh, glaciers. And I was actually quite taken at the end by the number of questions about the influence of climate change on uh, the whole topic of glaciers. So, yeah, I contacted uh, Mike and Rob and said, look, I've been preparing this uh, presentation for some time. I'm a volcanologist and uh, I've known for a long time that uh, major volcanic eruptions can actually have significant impacts on weather immediately and in some cases climate in, on the longer term. And what I became interested in is trying to put that into the context of all the possible factors that actually could contribute to climate change. And so that's what I've uh, developed here in this particular uh, talk. So we know that uh, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, uh, global climate has increased, uh, global temperature has increased about 1.2 uh, degrees centigrade. We know that uh, extreme uh, weather and climate events uh, are becoming more frequent. Um, and we also know that a significant increase in the amount of 
man-made or human-made, I should say, we'll, we'll share the blame, uh, human-made or anthropogenic greenhouse gases to the Earth's, Earth's atmosphere. And of course the question becomes uh, to what degree uh, does that anthropogenic component actually control the current increases in global temperature and changes in climate. Now to understand that we've also got to ask the question, has climate changed in the past before anthropogenic gases were introduced into the atmosphere? Okay, And if so, what were the processes that caused those changes and very importantly, what were the rates or the timescales at which they operate? Now, as a geologist, we know that major changes to the Earth system either happen very quickly, instantaneously, or like an extremely large and violent volcanic eruption, um, or they happen over a longer period of time and slowly. Now, given that this uh, temperature increase has occurred in the last 250 years, geologically, that's rapid. So what I want to evaluate is these various factors that contribute to uh, increasing global uh, temperature and climate change and evaluate which ones are rapid or fast and which ones are slow because we're looking for the ones that are fast. Okay, so here I've uh, listed the various causes of climate change that we'll very briefly review. Long-term planet heat loss, um, solar insulation changes, orbital behaviour of the, the, uh, the, the Earth around the, the, the Sun, asteroid impacts, volcanic gas and ash emissions, biological processes, the dynamics of the atmosphere and the ocean. That's really important because the Earth's ocean capture and store about 90% of the thermal energy at the Earth's surface. So we need to understand that. But also affecting uh, oceanic dynamics is actually the changing shape of those oceans over time, which brings in geological and tectonic processes that I want to briefly review. And then, of course, the, um, the elephant in the room, the anthropogenic or greenhouse uh, gas releases. So basically, when the Earth first formed 4.5 billion years ago, it formed through the aggregation of a lot of meteorites, asteroids, rocky debris in the solar nebula. And that aggregation generated a lot of frictional heat which basically caused all that rocky debris to melt. So the Earth actually formed as a ball of molten rock or magma as we called it. And we know that from the, the composition of the, the likely composition of the rocks that formed uh, soon after, that the surface temperature of the Earth at that time must have been at least 1500 degrees centigrade. Now we also know that now the Earth's core temperature is still 6000 degrees. So there's clearly a temperature gradient from 6,000 to 10 degrees centigrade average at the Earth's surface, which means that the Earth's interior will be progressively uh, emitting heat, uh, losing heat to the Earth's surface. And we'll, we'll, we'll work out how that all works uh, shortly. Um, now, what is the actual uh, rate at which that happens? It's actually 0 0.09 watts per square metre. And that loss of heat, it's very low, very low uh, fraction compared with the amount of incoming solar radiation, which is about 340 watts per square metre. Now that heat loss continues to be sourced from the residual heat from the original origin of the Earth uh, and also the progressive loss of heat during radioactive decay of uh, radioactive elements such as uranium, strontium, rubidium, um, potassium, etc. So basically, um, if we look at that very low flux of heat compared with solar incoming radiation, we can say, look, it's really, really low. And there's no evidence that that flux has changed at all in the last 250 years. So we can eliminate slow and progressive heat loss from the Earth's interior as a cause for the global warming that's occurred in recent times. Uh, this is a, a relatively recent map of the distribution of heat flow on the Earth's surface. It varies over the Earth's surface depending on the rock types that are exposed. Some are more radioactive than others. Uh, but also you can see that there's a significant difference between the, uh, the oceans, uh, for example, the, these red strips here, which geologists will recognise coincide with what we call oceanic spreading ridges, which I'll come back to shortly. They happen to... to experience the highest rate of heat loss uh, to the 
to the uh, uh, hydrosphere and the um, and the uh, the atmosphere. So we've talked about incoming solar radiation. Uh, basically, when the when the sun uh, releases its uh, its uh, thermal energy, it radiates it to the to the solar system. It only takes eight minutes for that um, basically ultraviolet radiation to uh, reach the Earth's outer outer atmosphere. Um, a lot of that ultimately gets reflected back to space. Some of it gets absorbed, uh, particularly at the Earth's surface, the oceans and the solid Earth. And then the, the warmed up and still warm uh, so, uh, surface of the Earth re-radiates a lot of that as infrared radiation back to the atmosphere. And infrared radiation is at a longer wavelength than ultraviolet, <coughs> and it really is at just the right uh, wavelength to be absorbed by greenhouse gases. And those greenhouse gases which absorb this, uh, this um, ultra-infrared sorry, infrared radiation include, of course, carbon dioxide, uh, surprisingly water, um, uh, methane, uh, and perhaps also surprisingly ozone. But there are, there are others too, including uh, nitrous, nitrous oxides. Now, um, what we've also noticed since satellites were able to start measuring accurately the flux of solar radiation to the Earth's uh, atmosphere is that they, the intensity of that radiation actually cycles on an 11-year cycle. So every year, every 11 years, there's a peak and then there's a, there's a trough. There's a peak and there's a trough. But those changes actually only account for a change in temperature of 0.1 to 0.4 degrees centigrade. And of course, after each peak of perhaps up to 0 0.4 4 degrees uh, centigrade, uh, it loses, the atmosphere loses that accumulated heat as, as, it, as there's a, a reduction and a, and a loss. There has been an attempt uh, using uh, radionuclides uh, to, to assess a longer term pattern of uh, solar radiation or irradiance flux. Um, actually, at the moment, the, the technology and the resolution is not very, very good. There's been a few cooling of, uh, events in the early 18th and 19th century uh, that have been identified, but no specific, say, thermal warming events. So this diagram shows in yellow there this cyclicity of solar irradiance, and it's about an 11-year uh, cycle. Um, and then compared with that is the uh, rate at which temperature uh, on the Earth's surface has been increasing. So there are ups and downs in that uh, temperature rise, but overall the way has been upwards. Okay? And basically there's no parallelism between those cycles. So we can say reasonably confidently that that change in solar irradiance cannot really explain the relatively recent uh, temperature increase that the Earth's atmosphere has uh, experienced um, in the last few, few decades. We won't go into the details of this diagram. It's a commonly used figure in, uh, in climate science and meteorology. But basically what it shows is that overall in the last decades when we've been able to measure incoming uh, irradiation and outgoing uh, radiation from the Earth back to space, which happens all the time, it's been about a balance. So basically uh, 340 watts per square metre coming in and about 340 watts per square metre going out. All these different arrows show the internal feedback relationships between different types of um, so, uh, radiation, thermal energy radiation, um, between space, look, the atmosphere and the Earth's surface. So we're not going to go into that detail. Now, recently, uh, Lobedell have actually recognised that the amount of outgoing solar radiation is not as high as it used to be. So this has happened in the last 20 years. And the implication of that is that the Earth's atmosphere is actually retaining more heat than it used to radiate back to space. So there is evidence from that uh, energy balance uh, uh, research that basically the Earth's atmosphere is retaining more heat and is heating up. So then we get to the orbital behaviour of the Earth around the Sun. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the fact that uh, this defines Milankovitch cycles of a global uh, climate change. Now, the Earth orbits around the Sun, as do many of our, uh, as do all the planets of the solar system, but there are some variations in that orbital behaviour. And the first one is that the shape of the orbit, which is an ellipse, 
changes shape. It changes from, a, if you like, a flat ellipse to a fat ellipse. And of course, those changes mean that the distance between the Earth and the Sun changes, so that actually the amount of radiation that comes in on the longer time scale due to this uh, change in the what's called the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit uh, will affect the amount of thermal energy that's coming in. Another um, behaviour, orbital behaviour that changes is that we know that the Earth is spinning, right? But the axis of spin is inclined at an angle of between 21.5 and 24.5 degrees to the vertical. But that changes on a slow progression, a cyclicity, which is, which is basically um, uh, based on about 40,000 years. The eccentricity changes, mostly uh, changes on a 100,000 year basis. And then in addition to the Earth spinning and that uh, tilt of the orbital axis uh, uh, changing, that uh, axis also wobbles. So there's a shorter time scale of wobble, which is known as uh, precession, and that operates on about 20,000 year uh, time scale. Now, in concert, those various changes define 100 year, 100,000 year cycles of changing in the amounts of thermal radiation that come from the sun, which therefore affect the, the global um, uh, climate and temperature. Now this diagram, which comes from NOAA in the United States, uh, shows these various cycles in precession, obliquity, eccentricity, the change in the shape of the orbit, plus also the changes in the amount of solar energy forcing on the, on the Earth's uh, atmospheric temperature. And then below there, here's a record that I'll come back to a couple of times in this presentation of the changes in global uh, temperature over about the last one million uh, years. So zero present day and back to a million years. And you can see there have been peaks of high temperature and uh, troughs of low temperature. Now these peaks and troughs coincide with the uh, glacial stages, the, the low temperature stages, and the warmer interglacial stages of the current Pleistocene ice age that we are still in. And you can see particularly some of those peaks coincide quite well with the, the peaks in the eccentricity and also the changes in the, in the uh, precession. So here we, we have independent evidence that the Earth's climate does change naturally, in this case from orbital uh, behavioural changes as the Earth orbits around the Sun. So climate change is not just due to anthropogenic gases, okay? There are uh, natural changes, and there are others that we'll come back to. Now, this graph shown here is similar to that bottom one that I showed before, showing you temperature highs, temperature lows, and glacial and interglacial uh, episodes. Um, there are two graphs here. There's a, a red one, which is temperature change, and there's a black one, which is carbon dioxide levels. And you can see there's a remarkable sympathy between uh, increasing and decreasing temperature and increasing and decreasing carbon dioxide levels. Now again, this is all before anthropogenic gases like carbon dioxide were released. So the Earth actually had its own inbuilt cyclicity of not only temperature change, but also carbon dioxide change. Okay? And of course, this becomes a chicken and egg situation. Did carbon dioxide change because of changing temperature, or did temperature change because of changing carbon dioxide? And I'll come back to that, that question. And so it's a really important one. Now, um, what you'll see is that basically the carbon dioxide levels shown on the left here were more or less steady state, steady state, right? A nice balance. The Earth managed its own affairs pretty well. It got pretty hot at times, it got pretty cold at times, but basically the, the, the peak carbon dioxide level through this natural balance was about 300 parts per, per million. Except right at the end there, where this is the last 250 years, where basically the carbon dioxide level overshot 300 and now the latest, the latest uh, measure from uh, Mauna Loa Observatory in May this year is 424 parts per million. So there's been a dramatic acceleration in carbon dioxide levels, which are far above uh, what was the case through that natural time of balance uh, during, the, uh, during the Ice Age. 
So then we go to asteroid impacts. Now, the Earth is being impacted all the time by meteorites. Many of them are small, imperceptible. The, many of them actually get burnt up and evaporate in the, as they come through the Earth's atmosphere just through frictional heating. But bigger ones do make it to, to, to the Earth's uh, surface. The Earth experienced a lot of asteroid impact during its early formation stages uh, to greater than 4 billion years. But even so, sizable asteroids uh, still impact the Earth's surface. For example, that image there of meteorite crater in Arizona, which was formed about 50,000 years ago. Perhaps one of the best studied ones in terms of potential um, climate impacts is the Shishilub asteroid, which impacted the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico just about 65 million years ago. Now, it's really important because it has been attributed as causing the demise and the extinction of not only the dinosaurs, but also many other species uh, at the time. And there's been quite a lot of uh, analysis of what the, what the impact effects were. Um, basically, there was an initial uh, frictional heating, just lasting minutes, perhaps. Um, then there was a basic uh, interval of, um, um, of cooling, uh, where basically the atmosphere was loaded with a lot of dust and soot, sulphate aerosols, which generated um, a period of cooling. But also the location where that asteroid impacted the Earth's surface was dominated by limestone bedrock, calcium carbonate. And that impact actually vaporised and actually melted a lot of that bedrock. And a lot of that stuff got uh, 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 liberated and, uh, and uh, ejected into the atmosphere, which then increased the carbon dioxide level of the atmosphere and caused an extended period of warming. So that's what asteroids can potentially do. But from our interest point of view, there has been no major asteroid, one that's big enough to cause such effects over the last uh, uh, few million, million years, and certainly not in the last 250 years. So again, we can exclude this particular climate changing cause as an explanation for the uh, changing temperature of the globe in the last 250 years. And now to volcanic eruptions, and there's a bit of thunder outside to herald, herald my pet uh, topic, uh, volcanic uh, uh, eruptions. Okay, so the fact that we have an atmosphere is entirely due to volcanism and the release of volcanic uh, gases from the time that the Earth formed, is that magma ocean. Okay, this is a, a, a sort of a, a very average ballpark uh, listing of the uh, composition of volcanic gases, but they will vary from one volcano to another, from one eruption to another. But you'll notice that there's a lot of water there's actually quite a lot of carbon dioxide, much more than is present in the atmosphere at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of nitrogen. Well, there's, there's some nitrogen, but nowhere near as much as present. There's actually quite a lot of sulphur dioxide, and these are all important in our, in our general story. Now, if we compare that with the composition of the, of the atmosphere, the atmosphere's average water content is below 3% in general, and that's, of course, because a lot of it, a lot of that that's uh, ejected during volcanic eruptions rains out and feeds the rivers and the lakes and the oceans. So a lot of that erupted uh, um, water uh, gas from volcanoes actually ends up uh, in the oceans and, in fact, is responsible for the formation of the oceans. Uh, there's oxygen there, not erupted in volcanoes. Free oxygen is very scarce, so there's a biological source of that, obviously. Carbon dioxide level is much reduced relative to some volcanic eruption abundances, and that could again be explained largely by the influence of the biosphere, but also processes like rock weathering um, and other sort of controlling factors that we'll talk about. Uh, nitrogen is largely inert gas, so it's just accumulated over, over time. So what are the climate effects of these gas emissions? Well, actually, they're contrary. So if you keep pumping out carbon dioxide, and it is a constant contributor, it's been a long-term, slow contributor to the build-up of the atmosphere that we know now. It's been happening all the time. It's a background uh, effect. But obviously, in the long term, it will contribute to uh, atmospheric warming, largely because uh, it is a greenhouse gas and it will absorb that uh, radiation that 
infrared radiation from the, from the Earth's surface. So it traps heat. Sulfur dioxide, on the other hand, um, reacts with agents in the atmosphere to form sulfuric acid droplets, which we call a volcanic aerosol gas. These molecules of sulfuric acid are quite large, and they can actually reflect incoming solar radiation back to space. So basically, they have a cooling effect. And similarly, a lot of very fine suspended volcanic ash, which ranges in size from, from just a micron to several microns to tens of microns, but that surface area is enough to again reflect back to space a lot of uh, incoming solar radiation, particularly when we're dealing with extremely large volumes during extreme, extremely large explosive eruptions. So let's look at uh, carbon dioxide. Um, all right, so the, it's been, there's been a number of studies to calculate what the annual flux of volcanic carbon dioxide is to the, to the atmosphere. And the figure is generally up to about 260 million tonnes. Now, that sounds like one hell of a lot, and you think that's going to actually cause uh, a climate reaction. Well, it does over the long term, right? It contributes to the atmospheric content. But compare that with the amount of carbon dioxide that humans are releasing to the atmosphere per year. 40 billion tonnes, right? That's pretty shocking. So the, the input from volcanic gases is absolutely ins insignificant. Now, occasionally, there are some large-scale uh, volcanic eruptions. Uh, these tend to be longer-lived. We call these large igneous province of flood basalt uh, eruptions. And these eruptions can erupt huge volumes of lava, also very large volumes of gases, as we'll see, but they extend over in extended periods of time, anywhere from 10 years for a single eruption or, or tens of years to an extended time of such eruptions lasting millions of years. And um, calculations that have been done as to what their contribution are range from about 1 to 30 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide over extended periods of time of 4 billion years. Okay? Now, um, there have been no major carbon dioxide producing volcanic eruptions in the last 250 years. So we can exclude carbon dioxide from a volcanic source as being a cause of the current um, global warming. Let's now look at sulphur dioxide. As I mentioned, it reacts with a number of agents in the atmosphere, uh, hydroxyl ion, water, and also ozone, uh, to form these droplets of sulphuric uh, acid. And these, as I said, reflect um, um, solar radiation back to, to space. And I've also mentioned that fine volcanic ash basically increases the Earth's reflectivity or its albedo and also reflects solar radiation back to space. Some, some case examples. Mount Pinatubo, most of us here, many of us here, will remember the Mount Pinatubo eruption in 1991 in the Philippines. It erupted six or released six cubic kilometres of ash into the atmosphere, so quite a reflective capacity there. Also 20 million tonnes of sulphur dioxide um, and a reasonably significant amount of carbon dioxide. But it only produced, even though it was a spectacular eruption, it only produced a, a temporary um, atmospheric uh, temperature drop of about half a degree centigrade for two to three years, and then that, that effect dissipated. Uh, even further back, the Mount St Helens eruption, very spectacular, but really quite small scale and actually had no detectable uh, climate change effect. The biggest eruption, say, in the last 200, 250 years, ex explosive eruption, is that of Tambura in 1850 in Indonesia. And it released 150 cubic kilometres of ash, so an awful lot, and also uh, several um, uh, million tonnes of um, sulphur dioxide. But it was the biggest one, but only produced a temperature reduction of the atmosphere of 0.7 degrees centigrade, and again, that effect only lasted for two to three years, and then the effect uh, dissipated. The big explosive eruptions that we really need to be worried about are what are called super explosive caldera uh, eruptions. And the best, one of the best examples uh, in, in terms of magnitude was the eruption of Toba explosive caldera in Indonesia about 74,000 years ago. 
Now, that's a, a, a satellite image of, of Toba Caldera. The maximum dimension is nearly 100 kilometres. And it erupted um, nearly 3,000 cubic kilometres of, of ash, uh, several billion tonnes of sulphur dioxide, and that produced a combined surface cooling of at least three to five degrees centigrade, which is a lot on a global scale. That really does impact food chains, uh, etc. cetera, um, and at least for three to four years. Now, it's thought that they would have accelerated the glacial stage that the Earth was experiencing, plumbing it into a, a deeper and more intense glacial stage. And it also occurred at the time when there was a bit of a crisis in the number of Homo sapiens on the, on the planet, and there was apparently a bit of a drop in the, in the, uh, in the uh, number of Homo sapiens uh, at the time. So the climatic events are major from these really intense, explosive and large volume uh, uh, super eruptions. But we haven't actually had one for a long time. The last super eruption was just about 25,000 years ago from Taupo Caldera in New Zealand, and we certainly haven't had one in the last 250 years. So then there are these large uh, magnitude large igneous province or flood basalt province uh, eruptions. A uh, good example that's been well documented um, in the Columbia River um, province in the western United States was the Rosa eruption about 15 million years ago. Um, it erupted 1,300 cubic kilometres of uh, lava over a surface area of 40,000 square kilometres, which is about one-fifth of the surface area of Victoria. Um, the eruption lasted at least 10 years and it is thought to have uh, uh, erupted about 12 billion tonnes of sulphur dioxide. And that is estimated or calculated to have had a surface uh, cooling effect of somewhere between 15 uh, and 5 uh, degrees centigrade. So huge, huge effect. Now these big uh, flood basalt eruptions occur about every 30, 30 million years and they correlate pretty well with major mass extinction events. So in summary, only super eruptions are capable of causing rapid uh, uh, substantial climate change. Uh, there are none that really affect uh, global uh, climate We're involving the uh, emission of a lot of carbon dioxide. Ca sulfur dioxide uh, rich eruptions can in fact uh, produce a lot of uh, global cooling. But as I say, um, none of them can cause, can explain the current heating that we're experiencing. So then we go to biological processes, and these are, can also be contrary in their effects in terms of influencing the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere and the, and the oceans. So some are carbon dioxide absorbing, and these include photosynthesis, where plants absorb carbon dioxide and build uh, tissue and in the process, of course, release um, oxygen. Uh, just some interesting facts um, that I picked up from the, from the web. Um, a reasonable sized tree can absorb about 25 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year, or about a tonne over a 40 uh, year uh, growth, growth uh, period. And now that again, as I've mentioned, is insignificant uh, in terms of the amount of anthropogenic carbon dioxide that we are emitting. And there's been some back-of-the-envelope calculations that suggest that to um, counteract uh, the, the, um, the anthropogenic uh, output that we're, we're currently throwing into the atmosphere would require the planting of 40 billion trees per year. Now, that's not going to happen, but re re reforesting the Earth's surface is an important mechanism for capturing carbon, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide back from the, from the atmosphere. Now, there are also carbon dioxide producing processes in the biosphere. Uh, respiration, obviously, is a really important one um, from animals and, and plants. Um, and apparently, uh, they, well, um, organisms um, absorb carbon dioxide to build their skeletons and also their organic tissue. But then they, they, then they also um, um, basically release carbon dioxide during uh, respiration. 
um, a lot of the carbon dioxide that plants absorbed is also released back through plant respiration uh, back to the, to the atmosphere. About 30% of what they absorb goes back to the, the, the atmosphere. Okay, and then of course there's the decay of organic matter, whether it's just loose litter on the Earth's surface or whether it's from exposed organic accumulations of coal and of course uh, oil and gas, etc. Okay, now um, there are some sort of generalisations that can be made. So uh, before skeletal organisms um, evolved uh, and, and also plants, the CO2 levels were relatively high on Earth. Before photosynthetic um, organisms evolved, um, anywhere between, let's go back, anywhere between 2.5 and a billion years ago, uh, basically oxygen levels were relatively low and carbon dioxide uh, levels were high. And before respiratory organisms evolved, carbon dioxide levels were lower uh, relative than before. So these changes, however, in carbon dioxide levels uh, through biospheric processes are reasonably slow and they're also steady. They're part of this normal background accumulation of carbon dioxide and, and other um, um, uh, 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 greenhouse gases uh, through, through time. So basically we can, we can say that apart from deforestation in the last 250 years, these other processes probably haven't contributed to the very rapid uh, temperature rise that we've experienced. So then we go to the dynamics of the Earth's atmosphere and the ocean. And what I've grabbed here is a, a simple cartoon from Wikipedia of the globe and its current largely atmospheric circulation systems. Now, if we just took a simple globe, uh, we know that the poles are cold, the equators are hot, and that should set up a simple north to south and south to nor north convection system that redistributes heat over the Earth's surface. Okay? Now, the thing that stops that single, simple convective cell re redistribution of thermal energy is the fact that the Earth is rotating. And that exerts a, a shear force called the Coriolis force on these winds that are moving north and south. And that def deflects them into latitudinal flow patterns and breaks up that theoretical single north-south cell into three latitudinal cells, okay? So you end up with these deflected uh, wind patterns um, uh, along the latitudes. Now that's really important because um, the winds actually generate the surface oceanic currents of the oceans, right? Through wind shear drag uh, effects. And so basically what that's done is generated uh, major um, uh, global oceanic uh, currents which basically flow latitudinally, okay? Um, now, this is a nice theoretical model, but it presumes that the Earth has no continents, okay? So the continents actually interfere with this very simple circulation pattern. And this is, this is really important because we know that the oceans are the uh, major heat sinks and also carbon dioxide sinks, and anything that affects their global uh, circulation patterns then also affects the redistribution of thermal energy on the Earth's uh, surface. So continents only emerged above sea level about 2.5 billion years ago. So that model that I showed you in the previous cartoon actually would have been valid in those times. But now we have the continents as we see them here on a Mercator projection. And of course, what we know is that these latitudinal oceanic currents that I talked about actually get deflected by the margins of the continents, both northwards and southwards. So if we take, for an example, a really important oceanic current, um, oh, and, and by the way, that then also um, entraps or encloses the major oceanic gyre currents, which are again uh, latitudinally uh, constrained and also constrained by the continents. But let's take an example of one of these uh, currents that is deflected north, and this is the Gulf Stream here in the Atlantic, and it gets deflected along the eastern margin of North America and then along the eastern margin of Greenland and reaches the Arctic Ocean. And what that, um, that uh, current does, it delivers warm tropical waters to those high latitudes 
and that increases the evaporation rate of seawater in the poles, uh, which then, of course, leads to a lot of uh, water moisture in the atmosphere. And because of the low temperature of the atmosphere, that very you know, quickly induces condensation and precipitation of snow, which then begins to build up snow fields and ice sheets in those polar uh, regions. Okay? But basically, uh, that re redistribution of thermal energy from the tropics up into the poles is a really important part of that story. Now, the next logical step and question that we could ask is, that's all well and good, but have the continents always been in their current position? Okay? And the answer is no. The currents actually move. And the first person who cottoned onto this was a meteorologist by the name of Alfred Wagner. And he was just looking at a map of the world one day and looking particularly at the Atlantic Ocean. He said, isn't that amazing how the continental margins on the east and the west of the Atlantic actually fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. Amazing. And it's the same in the, in the south here. So he cut out shapes of these continents and sure enough, he fitted them back together as a jigsaw puzzle. And then he thought, well, if these continents were together and then separated, maybe if we look at the geology of the continental masses on each side of the oceans, we might get matching geological belts of the same rock types, the same ages, and perhaps of the same climatic significance. There are certain sedimentary deposits, for example, the deposits from, from uh, high latitude uh, glacial activity, or the deposits from uh, tropical to, to temperate desert dune uh, environments, such as the Sahara Desert, or uh, swamps that, that accumulate organic matter and build coal uh, deposits that are very uh, indicative of past latitudes. So when uh, Wagner did this, he did in fact get those matches of geological belts. So the question now is, how do those continents move? And it really wasn't until the 1960s that geologists who were a little bit slow on taking up Wagner's idea of continental drift and, and uh, migration uh, came up with the, the solution. And I'll start with a simple story of, of what, I start, what I mentioned at the start, that the Earth's interior is very hot, 6,000 degrees centigrade. Its surface is sort of average, about 10 degrees centigrade. So there's a temperature gradient, and that temperature gradient actually drives convection overturn in the Earth's interior, in what is known particularly in the Earth's mantle. The Earth's mantle there is plastic. It's not totally liquid, but it's plastic. It's plastic enough to be be able to convect in response to this temperature gradient. Now, in locations where upwelling limbs of adjacent uh, convection cells converge and rise towards the Earth's surface, they then begin to diverge underneath this solid cap of the outer shell of the Earth, which is called the lithosphere. And that then drives or pulls apart that lithosphere. It causes it to split or to rift. And as a result, new molten magma can actually rise up into that rising rift um, along what we call spreading ridges, oceanic spreading ridges. So if we look at the cartoon on the right here, we took a slice through the Earth again, a little bit more detail, we see these oceanic spreading ridges and the, the lithosphere there is these lithospheric slabs or plates as they're called, are very, very hot, they're lower in density, but as the plates get rafted to the side, as new magma wells up in the, in the rifts there, uh, that lithosphere gets colder and older, a little bit like us, um, and becomes denser, and then actually begins to sink back or subside back into the Earth's interior um, along what are known as the oceanic trenches or the subduction zones. So you get recycling of the lithosphere. And very importantly, continents are passengers on these lithospheric plates. So when um, new spreading ridges form, continents get pulled apart and the continents just drift apart as new lithosphere forms and, and enlarges. And then, of course, conversely, when, continents begin, when plates begin to converge together along trenches, continents can actually come together and, and collide. Now, the proof of that mechanism came from being able to age date the rocks of the ocean floor. 
And that was done through the magnetic, magnetic properties of the, of the uh, new young oceanic crust, plus also being able to collect samples and submit them to radiometric age dating. And what that showed was clearly the youngest rocks on the seafloor coincide with the uh, mid-oceanic spreading ridges, as they're called, and the oldest rocks are furthest away and close to the uh, seafloor trenches where subduction is beginning to occur. So now the, the next logical question can, we can ask is, does this migration of the continents, could that actually cause climate change? And the answer would be yes, if the continents are drifting across latitudes in north-south directions, okay? So let's look at this map here. And what this simple map shows is the major continents, the major oceans, and the sort of little um, dog-tooth uh, indented uh, lines there represent the mid-oceanic spreading ridges. And you'll see there's one between Antarctica and Australia. Um, now, that means that Australia is actually migrating or drifting northwards away from Antarctica. That all started to happen about 65 million years ago, as I'll show you shortly. Now, let's look at the rate at which that's happening. Australia is drifting at seven centimetres per year northwards. That amounts to a huge distance of seven metres per hundred years. And if you want to calculate what the temperature effect of that, uh, uh, that uh, northward displacement is, it, it amounts to 0.0000.929 degrees centigrade. So just through northward migration of Australia, we are not, our climate here in Melbourne is not going to change significantly through that as a factor. Okay. Now, what I want to show you is a, is a brief uh, video which um, shows a reenactment, a reconstruction of the way that continents have drifted and migrated over the last five or six hundred million years. Now, not only have we been able to calculate from, uh, uh, from the record of the modern oceans as to where continents were in the past, but also from analysing magnetic minerals in volcanic rocks of different ages in the geological past, back to about five or six hundred million years, we're actually able to locate where those rocks were formed uh, on the Earth's surface. And all that work's been put together in, a, um, in an animation by Scorsese, who's a genius at this. Okay, so this is about 500 million years ago. There are no recognisable continents there. The continents shown in green and brown. The pale blue represent continental shelf areas and the dark blue uh, shows deep ocean basins. So everything's happy. The white shows fluxing, advancing and, and retreating glacial ice sheets corresponding with some ice ages in the past. So when we get beyond 300 million years, you'll start to see that the continents are all aggregating together into a single supercontinent called Pangaea, which means that the rest of the globe was basically open, wide open ocean. There's another flux of uh, ice sheet advance from the, from the South Pole. And now from about this time, you start to see these continents, I'll just stop the, stop the animation there. You can now see the outlines of the continents as we know them. North America, South America, uh, Africa, Eurasia, um, um, Antarctica and Australia. So what happens as we go? Okay, so here you'll first start to see the North Atlantic beginning to open. See it there? And you'll also start to see the South Atlantic beginning to open. You'll now also start to see India, Antarctica and Australia separating from each other, the Atlantic Ocean opening, and you'll see that India is making a great sprint northwards and colliding with Asia, where it crashes and forms the Himalayan mountain chain, which also had a very significant climatic effect on Earth. Australia continues to um, drift northwards, and it will for quite some time, and in time we will actually collect all of these island nations of Southeast Asia making us even more multicultural than we already are. Uh, what you also see on this map here is the ice sheets of the, the Northern Hemisphere 
and the, the southern, sea, southern hemisphere, which coincide with the Pleistocene Ice Age. Okay, so a question then obviously arises, did the Earth experience climate change uh, in the past, uh, as well as obviously uh, the climate change that, that we're experiencing uh, at the moment? The answer is yes. How do we know? Because we can actually measure past temperatures using a, a geochemical proxy. And the geochemical proxy that is used is the ratio of the oxygen isotope 18 to the oxygen isotope 16. And that, the value of that, that ratio, that uh, ratio which is called delta, delta 18, actually changes according to oceanic surface temperature, particularly in the tropics. So we can actually collect fossils of different ages back in the past, and we can act, analyze their calcium carbonate skeletons, separating out the oxygen and subjecting that to delta 18 analyses. And so we can actually measure past temperatures in the past, plot where those fossils lived and died in the past, and then evaluate what the um, uh, climate uh, may have been and the climate changes. Now, this is a really co uh, complicated diagram. I'm going to make it simple. The top image there shows over 57,000 delta 18 analyses, right? And the analyses span from just over 500 million years through to the present day. Now, you can see that the value of those delta 18 analyses fluctuate from troughs, which coincide with high temperatures, to peaks, which coincide with low temperatures, and there's a pulsing up and down, right? And the calculations of what the temperatures might have been in the past are on this second diagram there. Um, these different graphs uh, reflect different possible temperatures, and they're based on using different models that the geochemists use. Now, which one is correct is irrelevant. What is important here is that they all have the same shapes, the same bump, bumps and the same troughs, which tells us definitely that global temperatures rose and fell very significantly and can actually coincide with hot periods and ice age periods. So I mentioned that there were ice ages in the past. Well, here's the timing of the major ones. And then the, the bottom diagram again shows you the uh, determination, again from using a series of geochemical proxies, uh, the um, amount of carbon dioxide that was in the environment at various times in the past, again going back to about 500 million years plus. And again what you'll notice is that the peaks and the troughs in carbon dioxide coincide with the peaks and the troughs in temperature. So that there is a long-term global parallelism between temperature and carbon dioxide. And we want to come back and address that uh, uh, shortly. So now we get to the, um, the, 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 the question, I think, that's always on our minds, is that is, what effect do anthropogenic greenhouse gases have um, on uh, the Earth's environment? So I remind you that the principal uh, greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, uh, methane, nitrous oxides. We can add water there, and we can also add that uh, compound that I forgot, ozone, yes, ozone. Uh, we can add that there as well. Um, I've excluded water there because um, water is actually a very significant uh, greenhouse gas. It does trap heat, and when it, uh, it water condenses, that heat goes into the oceans, uh, but then, of course, it evaporates, it goes back into the atmosphere, so there's a, there's a recycling there. And a lot of studies have shown that basically there's a, a positive feedback loop that water uh, concentration in the atmosphere increases when global temperature increases. So it's not the other way around that uh, global temperature increases when water uh, content increases. So we know that we have natural uh, greenhouse gases and we also have these artificial greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide is uh, generated by uh, humans by burning vegetation and obviously fossil fuels, uh, extracting cement and also um, uh, coal, um, farm use, ploughing, um, and also generally from deforestation. Um, methane um, also uh, forms from the decay of uh, um, organic uh, material and also by the burning of uh, fossil fuels. Um, now, methane is a real worry because although its abundance is not as 
great as that of carbon dioxide at the moment, its impact in terms of global heating is at least 28 times that of carbon dioxide. And the level of methane that is currently being released as an anthropogenic gas is increasing at alarming levels. Then we also get nitrous oxides, which uh, result from uh, just uh, natural emissions uh, from um, uh, soil, soil bacteria. It's also released uh, from fertilisers and the burning of, of uh, fossil fuels. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, it's also used during uh, childbirth as, a, as an anaesthetic, laughing gas. Um, now, uh, uh, nitrous oxide is even more of a problem because its heating effect is 265 times that of, um, of um, uh, carbon dioxide. So uh, these are a real uh, worry. Now, we can actually measure the abundance of these gases in the present atmosphere in the oceans, but we can also measure them into the recent past, for example, during the recent ice age, because the major ice caps in Greenland and Antarctica have been drilled right, almost right through, and ice cores have been extracted, and then in those ice cores there are actually trapped pockets of air which are of the age of the ice layer at the depth in the core when it formed. So we can actually measure what the gas contents and abundances were in the atmosphere at various times in the uh, recent past. So basically, uh, CO2 and temperature change naturally in a state of balance until 250 years ago. So here's uh, carbon dioxide levels there. These are the ups and downs coinciding to glacial and interglacial uh, stages. And as I mentioned before, everything was in balance up to an optimum level of about 300 parts per, per million. And then in the last 250 years, everything has skyrocketed. Okay? Um, the level of uh, changes actually mirror the cycles of cold and warm stages, both temperature plus also carbon dioxide. Now, I want to address that, that, that compatibility of carbon dioxide and, and temperature. First of all, carbon dioxide is more soluble in seawater when the temperature is low. So during cooler temperature periods, carbon dioxide will be extracted from the atmosphere and absorbed into the, into the oceans. Um, and conversely, when temperature is high, uh, carbon dioxide is less soluble, so it's released into, into the atmosphere. That's one, one effect. The second effect is during glacial uh, stage advances of these huge continental ice sheets, a lot of pre-existing ve vegetation gets buried underneath the ice sheets. Okay? And basically, all that carbon dioxide uh, that is in that vegetation gets trapped uh, there and stored. But what happens when the ice sheets retreat? All that vegetation gets exposed and is, is, is being discovered now in the permafrost regions of the world. And that carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide is then being released. So, yes, there, there is a sympathetic relationship. Um, and is it temperature uh, causing carbon dioxide levels to rise or is it carbon dioxide levels causing temperature to rise? I think the, all the uh, research that's been done, particularly by climate scientists, say it's the rising carbon dioxide levels that causes the global temperature uh, to, to rise. So these are the various contributions of uh, carbon dioxide from the, the various anthropogenic uh, sources, uh, gas, uh, coal, uh, what have I missed, oil. Oil, green, uh, gas, and then coal are the main ones. And you can see that the uh, abundance of carbon dioxide has actually been increasing re very dramatically, and particularly uh, since about uh, 1950. Now, a question that I asked myself when I was getting interested in this is, how can we really be sure that it is all anthropogenic carbon dioxide and not just natural carbon dioxide? Is there some way that we could geochemically fingerprint carbon dioxide that's released through the burning of fossil fuels to distinguish it from carbon dioxide that is released naturally and that has been in the atmosphere for a long time? And the answer is yes. And again, it's, it's uh, isotope geochemistry that's really important. There are three isotopes of carbon, 12, 13 and 14. 14 is the one that's used in, 
in carbon dating. We ignore that. Um, carbon-12 is the one that's absorbed mostly by organisms when they built plant tissue and skeletons and, and organic tissue. And, of course, when um, vegetation material or fossil vegetation material such as coal, gas and oil are burnt, it's large volumes of carbon-12 that are released into the atmosphere. And carbon-12 relative to fairly static levels of carbon-13. So basically, when we combust fossil fuels, we're um, lowering the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12, or conversely, if you like, increasing the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13. Now, what that tells us is that the rise of carbon dioxide in the last 50, 70 years, and certainly in the last uh, 150 to 250 years, is almost entirely due to the release of anthropogenic uh, gases. And here's the, one of the key papers that has demonstrated that by Keeling et al. in 2017, which shows the, the decline of that 13 to 12 ratio, and particularly the acceleration of that decline in the last uh, 50 years or so. So um, measurement of carbon dioxide levels, um, methane, nitrous oxide, particularly from ice cores, over the last few hundred years have shown the following trends. Carbon dioxide going up and down a bit, up and down a bit, but then since the start of the Industrial Revolution, skyrocketing. Similarly with methane, skyrocketing. And then with nitrous oxide, again, exactly the same. Here's the uh, temperature increase uh, over the last uh, decades or so. Uh, fairly steady state, um, last century or so. Fairly state, just before World War II, everything begins to ramp up. Um, so World War II certainly had an impact on uh, temperature uh, increase. And then particularly from the 1950s on, onwards today, which correspond basically with the automobile explosion, temperature has increased and accelerated at, uh, difficult, at extreme rates. The relative contributions at the moment of carbon dioxide versus methane and nitrous oxide in terms of uh, affecting um, uh, global uh, temperature is 60% carbon dioxide and 40% to the others, but that is changing as methane and nitrous oxide increases. In terms of uh, temperature change, this is the historic record from actual measurements. This is the predicted or projected trajectory of temperature change uh, based on various climate models. Okay? Even the, the worst case model uh, predicts a, a uh, temperature increase of 2 degrees uh, centigrade uh, over the, the next um, century and, and a half or, or more. So it's, it's not looking good. When we look at actual ice mass loss from glaciers and polar ice caps, it's substantial and it's climbing, it's cumulative, it's increasing um, as time ticks by. When we look at sea level rise, it's, it's risen uh, about 20 centimetres uh, since about uh, 1750, but here are the projections based on the various climate models um, anticipating various degrees of temperature increase. Again, pretty catastrophic uh, changes in sea level uh, rise, and that, of course, affects the low-lying island continents and nations and the delta uh, nations of, of the world, uh, ar uh, around the world in various places. So the consequences of rising anthropogenic uh, levels are significant. Increased oceanic and ocean temperatures. Um, sea level has been rising, um, and that, of course, is going to eventually lead to mass displacement of population. Um, more extreme global temperature gradients and extreme weather can be expected. Uh, threats to native uh, uh, fauna and flora. Um, Eventually, this is all going to lead to famine and uh, mass migrations of producing huge numbers of climate refugees. We're perhaps already beginning to see that happening. And also, there are going to be extreme effects through acidification of the oceans in terms of the impact on organisms uh, in the oceans. Now, if you're still not convinced that anthropogenic gases are largely responsible for uh, current uh, global climate increase and climate change, and therefore we perhaps shouldn't do anything, let's look at the health impacts of these anthropogenic uh, gases. So even if the climate scientists are only 50% correct about rising temperatures, 
this is still going to be a disaster for the Earth, humans and other species. Okay? All of those projections that we just looked at, we can scale them back a little bit, but the projections are still going to be onwards and upwards. Okay? But in terms of the health impact of burning fossil fuels, uh, the, the, the effects are staggering. So basically, um, millions of people are already beginning to die in different countries through thermal uh, stress uh, heat effects. Um, basically, the suspended microparticles, um, these are just fine ash particles, um, PM, part particulate matter, uh, with a lower limit of 2.5 microns, can have a devastating effect, debilitating effect on uh, people's health. And there are already estimates that in 2012, 10 million deaths of people over 14 years uh, can be attributed to, to this. Toxic gases that are released all will have uh, long-term uh, both fatal and health impacts. And of course, the uh, financial impacts on our health systems are just extraordinary. And Pereira has done a very um, comprehensive uh, assessment for the uh, costs in the United States and also the costs of not doing anything, what the longer term costs will be. Okay? So it's not just the visible costs at present, but what the longer term costs will be. So there is a real imperative to reducing uh, fossil fuel uh, emissions. So overall conclusions, uh, climate has changed naturally since the Earth formed, but all the natural changes um, have basically been uh, slow compared with the effects of the anthropogenic gases which have had a fast impact. I think we can unequivocally attribute rising global temperatures in the last 250 years to the burning of fossil fuels and extraction of uh, cement and, uh, and other commodities. Um, the only other fast uh, uh, causes could have been volcanic gas emissions, but as I've already said, carbon dioxide just doesn't cut it. And also, obviously, um, asteroid impacts, and we just don't have uh, uh, any evidence that that's happened in the last 250 years. So here's a, here's a, a question just to, just, just to finish on. Is carbon dioxide all bad? What would happen if we removed all carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? It would get extraordinarily cold. And there have been calculations that the Earth's surface temperature would uh, drop by between 40 and 50 degrees centigrade. So basically, we'd be below freezing pretty well the whole time. Okay? So the, there is value in, in greenhouse gases because they um, moderate, they mediate heat loss, heat gain, etc., from the various sources that we've discussed. It's just uh, identifying the Goldilocks balance that um, allows us to have some control. And there is one way in which we control it, and that's through anthropogenic gas release and emissions. So now... Now the Thank you, Ray. Lovely perspective on time. Time is such a difficult concept for everyone to understand. But in terms of understanding stuff, that's a very logical presentation of good science across all of the things that have changed the climate, let's say 500 million years. Why is that not understood? Yeah, I think, I think because there is just so much focus on the anthropogenic side of things. And also, um, it takes a while to get your head around all this stuff, right? So um, I've been lucky since I retired. I've had time to sit and ponder, which most academics these days, by the way, don't have that luxury. They don't have time to sit and ponder. Um, but, yeah, you've, you've got to be prepared to delve into disciplines that are outside your area of expertise. Um, of course, a few people have tried, and I think they've got it horribly wrong. I won't mention any names, but... Um, You're amongst friends. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it is important to, to get this balance and also to help people, you know, the, the lay public, to help the lay public understand all of this context. Yeah. And that's really what it's about. Yeah. Yep. But context and rates. Rates is the, is the critical thing. Yeah, critical thing. thing. Yeah. yeah, critical thing. Yeah. Uh, let's, uh, who has a question? I know there's some people who are desperately interested in this topic here with us tonight. John Link, a long-term member here. Um, um, I've got a, um, an industrial business 
Um, I read recently that with the increase of exploration to depth that they've found um, a lot of subsea volcanoes, said to be about a million of them, and I wondered this is, whether this is increasing the temperature of the water and, and affecting the uh, surface ice. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, that, that's a question I've been asked quite a few times as a volcanologist. Um, yes, obviously, at the place where a volcanic eruption occurs, there is the release of quite a lot of heat to the immediate environment, and particularly where subglacial volcanic eruptions occur, which happens quite a lot, for example, in Iceland, you start to get the melting of the base of the glacial uh, mass, and then eventually you get a melt pond forming above the volcanic vent. But the rest of the ice sheet sits there quite happily. So you get a, a localised uh, heating effect. Um, and I guess if there were enough of these eruptions happening, um, there might be a sort of a slow cumulative effect. Um, but um, as I said, volcanism has been occurring on Earth for a long period of time. So that regular re release of heat and volcanic gases has just been contributing to the status quo. And basically to address, to address this question of uh, explaining the uh, heating of the atmosphere and the, and the oceans in the last decades and couple of centuries, we've got to come up with some um, more significant uh, causes and, and reasons. And as I say, the only one that I can really come up with is uh, anthropogenic uh, gases. My name is Rob Day. I'm, I'm an ex-councillor of Royal Society and, and from Melbourne Uni, I'm, and I'm a marine biologist by by tradition. Um, well, ex you, excuse, you excuse any sins that I might have committed no, no, on no, the biological no. side. Um, <laughs> you, you talked about uh, carbon dioxide uh, extensively, but um, when you talked about methane and why it's rising uh, much more recently in, in uh, large quantities, um, that's that's something I, I I didn't quite catch. Why why is methane rising so fast, and are there sort of synergisms with uh, natural release of of methane that are starting to come into this uh, rise of methane in particular? Right. Thank you. So a lot of methane is stored in the uh, soil profile. And it's also stored particularly in uh, coal seams and to some degree in fossil oil and oil and oil and gas. So uh, since the um, retreat of the ice sheets at the end of the last glacial stage, about 11,000 years ago, um, a lot of area that used to be covered uh, by ice sheets is now being exposed in the higher latitude permafrost regions, Russia, Alaska, etc. And these are now exposing a lot of carbon that used to be buried, uh, but is now, of course, being exposed and releasing uh, through organic decay a lot of that stored uh, organic um, uh, vegetation. And a lot of the, the methane is actually coming from the, the melting of the permafrost belts at the, the higher latitudes. But, but also just from ongoing um, coal mining, particularly uh, open cut mining, uh, there is a lot of methane uh, that is actually released through uh, through uh, through coal mining. So, so what about fracking? Yeah, um, um, I'm not a great fan of fracking at all um, uh, because it can contaminate the um, the uh, aquifers, the water tables, um, depending on what is being intersected and what then contaminates the the uh, the water system. So, fracking is a process whereby bedrock is fractured, basically, to allow uh, particularly uh, gases uh, to seep through, through the fractured uh, uh, bedrock and then be uh, extracted through, uh, through gas wells. Um, and of course, the, uh, the gas that is being extracted does contain a lot of these um, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gases. And where those gases, as they're being extracted, intersect aquifers, they're likely to, to actually uh, contaminate those, those aquifers. And it's not just the gases, it's the particulate matter, uh, a lot of which is actually uh, quite toxic. Does, does the methane also tend to come out um, as a sort of e emission as a result of fracking? Do, do you get extra yeah. releases? Yep. 
Yep. So there's a lot of there's a lot of gas escape during uh, during fracking, plus also during actual uh, gas gas wells that extract uh, subsurface gas uh, and oil. So that there is some some loss of gas associated with those extraction activities. Uh, and can we measure any of that? Um, I'm sure we can, but I don't have the, the data, actually. James, I'm going to get you to come down to see Catriona at the desk here whilst I... I was actually going to ask a question myself. You can, you can ask yes. a question. James Driscoll, Monash University. Um, Ray, can you quantify how much uh, is coming from agricultural uh, rearing of cattle? Is there any way to actually quantify that with other, for methane in particular? No, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, uh, with the detailed figures of, um, of uh, methane. Um, well, well, but hang on, I think I showed a slide and I uh, included a figure there that um, perhaps up to about a 20, 120 billion tonnes um, can actually result from um, stock and also land use, farming and land use. Yes, because uh, the constant tilling of the soil does release a lot of uh, or expose a lot of organic material, including the release of uh, gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, uh, and, uh, and even nitrous oxides. Yes, so it's significant. Neville, Neville Nichols at the back of the room has got a bit of experience with this subject. Thanks, Rob. Um, I'm Neville Nichols. I'm also an emeritus professor at the same school <laughs> as Ray. So this is a bit insular, isn't it? Um, so my question isn't so much about climate, it's driven by the, your, the first uh, cause of climate change you talked about, about sort of the heating from the, the centre of the earth through volcanoes. My question is why aren't there more huge volcanic eruptions? Surely that, that, that situation is very unstable, we're very warm, very hot in the middle of the earth. Um, why, why don't we get more eruptions? Um, we've got time for another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Get in the queue. Yeah. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, you know there is a temperature gradient, and that you get some circulation in the in the uh, uh, convective circulation in the mantle, and some of that molten rock comes up at the crest of the mid-oceanic ridges, right? Now, apart from that, you've also got the uh, locations where lithospheric slabs and plates are being recycled back into the Earth's interior at the oceanic trenches or subduction zones. And that then produces a line of volcanoes, which we call arc volcanoes. For example, the Pacific Ring of Fire uh, volcanoes are the result of that subduction process, the partial melting of some of that downgoing lithosphere, which produces new magma, including uh, the, vol the vol volcanic gases. So um, there are, of course, a lot of volcanic eruptions uh, along those arc environments, as well as fairly constant um, eruptions along the mid-oceanic ridges, and of course from just random intraplate hotspot locations, for example, Hawaii, um, uh, which, which are releasing quite a lot of um, thermal energy and also volcanic gases uh, to, to, the, to the atmosphere. And occasionally, particularly in those ring of uh, fire volcanic systems, we have these extremely large explosive super cold calderas, like like Toba um, and uh, uh, not so much Yellowstone, that's an intercontinental one, but that's another a big intercontinental one, um, which, which do erupt explosively. There are, there are many, for example, in New Zealand, North Island of New Zealand. There are many in South America. And if they, 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 they have many eruptions, they have small eruptions, small eruptions, small eruptions, and then perhaps every 600,000 years, that seems to be about a, a common theme for some of the biggest ones, you have a super explosive eruption. And they're the ones that actually can cause uh, critical uh, impacts, create critical impacts on, uh, on global climate and create uh, climate change over the next 10 years, decades, and maybe even longer term. Um, now, the, the, what causes rock to melt under those arc volcanoes is really quite complex because it depends on not only the, the heat flow situation, but also, very importantly, the amount of volatiles, particularly water, that is being released from the downgoing lithospheric slab, which impacts the melting temperature of the, the mantle etc., which, as I mentioned, I could talk about an hour on uh, in, in itself. So this is happening fairly constantly, 
Um, you know, you go online and you'll find that there are four or five or ten volcanoes erupting somewhere uh, all the time. So there, there is this constant release of thermal energy uh, to the to the environment, uh, both atmosphere and to the to the uh, to the oceans um, through volcanic uh, eruptive activity. But occasionally you'll just get these super explosive events. And, and when's the next one of those? Just. <laughs> Uh, there's, a, there's a question over here, eh, from one, some, someone online. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to mix two questions together um, from YouTube and from Zoom. So thank you very much for the people tuning in. Uh, you have given us the benefit of the doubt, but you're showing us that humans are driving this, this global warming. Um, and there are so many people who... Like who, who don't believe in our contribution to climate change. There are politicians who are ignoring our contribution to climate change. You've also told us about the fact that there are economic and health burdens with these with these um, gases. So a question from Mona and a question from David is sort of what what can we do to change this? We've got yourself. We've got other. Um, professors in the room from the same school, like, are, are there any, <laughs> there any comments? Um, it all comes down to the will of politicians. Um, it's politicians who uh, control the purse strings. They drive a lot of policy that affects science. Um, and of course, uh, many uh, politicians and parties have vested interests uh, that they don't want to upset. And particularly where a lot of those vest vested interests actually contribute huge uh, sums of money to the, um, to the national GDP and the, and the national uh, uh, coffers, there are all kinds of conflicts of interests. Now, the, sci the science community, uh, including organisations such as the Academy of Science, have been trying to um, influence, convince uh, governments and politicians for a long time, and we've got to keep, keep at that. And we've also got to, under scientists have got to be, be pre prepared to go out into the communities. Uh, I actually give talks like this to a lot of U3A groups around Melbourne. So these are mostly retirees of a whole range of backgrounds. But I, I do that because I think this is a really important message uh, to get out there because, as we've, as we've discussed, it's really important to understand the context and stop focusing just on the, the anthropogenic gases, which everyone's sick to, hear, sick to death of hearing about. But if they actually understood um, you know, all, the, all the other possibilities and how they just don't stack up, then there could be a change in, in community attitude and, very importantly, in the change in the attitude of governments. Let me just step in for a minute while she's... Oh, there is... Yes, there is a... I thought you might have a question, sir. David Wilkinson. Um, uh, great presentation, so thank you very much. Um, just a question more from left field. I, is there a possibility that climate change and ra rising sea levels could actually have a, an impact on geology and um, by changing uh, pressure on the earth, Earth's surface and um, causing volcanism and things like that, the other way around. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting question because I think in that animation I pointed out the, uh, the different colours of, say, um, continental shelf areas versus deep oceans, right, and land areas. And obviously um, as sea level rises and it begins to inundate uh, the land masses, um, the, um, the continental shelves are also being inundated in a greater mass of water sitting above them. So um, we know that, uh, that continents and continental land masses can not only move laterally, but they can also bob up and down through a process of flotation because generally the bog density of continents is less than the bog density of the underlying mantle. So if you load continents up more, then they're going to exert a bigger weight on the underlying mantle and therefore basically they will begin to sink. Now conversely, when continents rise, and for example um, during that collision of India with Asia to produce the Himalayan mountain chain, the Himalayan chain was lifted to what is it, 10,000 metres altitude. And of course since that happened about um, I don't know, 30, 40 million years ago, uh, those mountains have actually been being eroded. So material, solid material is actually being removed from the crest of the Himalayan mountain chain, goes into the Indo-Gangetic plain and then eventually into the, into the uh, Indian Ocean. And so basically you're, you're redistributing mass 
Uh, and so basically, eventually, that, uh, that Indian landmass may actually begin to rise just a little bit more isostatically as, as rock material is being removed, but eventually it will re reach its, its, happy, its happy balance. Um, now, whether or not um, such loading can actually accelerate, for example, volcanic eruptions, has been discussed, for example, with the uh, polar ice, ice caps in Antarctica and Greenland. There are no active volcanoes in, in Greenland, so this, this discussion has mostly been relating to Antarctica, where there are sub-volcanic, sub sub-glacial uh, uh, sub, um, ice sheet volcanoes. Um, the, the question that's been released been raised mostly is if we get greater melting of the of the Antarctic ice sheet, and we've seen that's happening, a lot of mass is being removed, basically the load on the crust underneath is less, and will that therefore release the pressure on the underlying magma uh, systems and therefore enhance the potential for increased rates of volcanic eruption. Um, so confining pressure is a factor that determines whether or not uh, magma will rise and the rate at which it rises. But the biggest factor that drives magma upwards is its density contrast with its surrounding rock. So molten rock or magma is less dense than the still solid rock around it. Therefore, it becomes buoyant and therefore it rises. Okay, so buoyancy is a major factor that drives magma upwards. Um, uh, the, the effect of load is essentially to squeeze the, the tube, the, the drinking straw, uh, according to Pascal's principle. And so the, the, the heavier the load, uh, the, the more pressure there is in the magma, which will force it upwards. And if you reduce the load, the less pressure there is to drive it upwards. But buoyancy is still the essential factor that drives magma upwards. Now you're making me think very hard. Have a break. You've done very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was actually going to ask a question, something, a paper I read earlier this year, coming back to Rob Day's question. There's a small group at Stanford who'd been looking at uh, this rapid increase in methane uh, really over the last two or three years. And they actually did some work and they came to an initial conclusion that uh, through COVID, the reduced um, um, industry and motor vehicles on the road, which had been producing lots of nitrogen oxides, actually had a washing effect on methane. So that uh, without those nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere after the recent few years, methane levels will come up really rapidly. So there's some really interesting stuff going on uh, with all that as well. I should also, on um, your question about, you know, why aren't we doing things, the, the society has relatively recently, or in the last 12 months, reaffirmed our strategic, four strategic um, pillars, if you like. Um, the first three are the accepted uh, existential crises, uh, climate change or anthropogenic warming, as Ray's used the phrase. The second one being uh, biodiversity loss, the collapse of nature. The third, which is now a uh, United Nations Environment Program uh, accepted ex existential crisis is pollution, is wa pollution and waste. And the fourth one, importantly, given that we're now trying to push this organisation as a pillar of science-based decision-making and science speaking with one voice, our fourth pillar is the rise of misinformation. And we think that the society has a very strong role to play and we need to build this as strongly as we possibly can. So we invite anybody to join the, join the society. Come and ask me or Mike or anybody, any on the council, or send me, write to me at um, our brilliant new science uh, Victoria magazine that's got Radiax has uh, turned into a real, a full grown magazine now. Uh, and we really should be using it for a lot of conversations. But please understand that we're really wanting to re-establish this organisation after 160 odd years as a place where science is discussed and uh, where it can actually try to begin to manage misinformation on the basis of good scientific decision making. Uh, so um, can I ask Nicola Williams, who's, uh, who's a, a, a recent past vice president of, of the Royal Society, uh, but also Nick's the president of the Australasian Mining History Association and erstwhile lecturer in, are you all, all these Monash people tonight, uh, lecturer in chemistry at Monash. Uh, please to, uh, pass a vote of thanks to Ray. Thanks, Nick. Nick, come and stand by the microphone. So I was only told when I arrived that I was required to do this, but that's okay. Because I've known Ray since the early 1980s, I presume, enrolling students and all the rest of it. 
And he was a good lecturer then, and he's obviously kept that up. And from what uh, Rob was saying, Ray's certainly doing his bit to counter all the misinformation and also to try and explain how all these very complex questions we have to understand, we have to try and explain them to everybody else, but he's shown us quite clearly that it's the anthropogenic effects that are driving all this. So we all have to do what we can, I suppose. Sometimes I feel I'm glad I'm no younger, but um, with all this happening now, it's pretty depressing. But thanks, Ray, for explaining it all. That was really good. <laughs>